Welcome to the dissection of the back. Our dissection book for this and all other dissections in this series are going to be based on Grant's Dissector, the 15th edition. Today we're going to be dissecting all of the back, starting from superficial and then moving to deep. We'll start off by skinning the back. All of these dotted lines, if you refer to page number 8, starting in your dissector, will be lines of incision for your scalpel. In general, I like to use the scalpel as little as possible, but it is good to use it here. So you make these incisions, and basically what you're going to do is you're going to retract the skin and reflect it, and then discard it in the tissue container. This is a really good opportunity to actually tell you about my favorite technique to remove the skin, which is the buttonhole technique. You cut a little flap of skin, you cut a little hole for your finger, then you can retract it using your finger. This is actually much more efficient than using either your forceps or hemostats or just your fingers to pull on the skin because you can get a very nice and clean dissection plane and if you use any kind of tools no matter how hard you clamp down on a hemostat or forceps they might actually uh, slip and you might end up injuring yourself or others. So after you've removed all of the skin ideally you would then find in the superficial fascia the occipital artery and the greater occipital nerve. So I wouldn't spend too much time looking for either of these two, but it is a good opportunity to note actually here that the greater occipital nerve is actually the posterior or dorsal ramus of the second spinal nerve, so C2. But as our deep fascia is really, really dense, it might be really hard to find it, so let's not waste too much time. Let me drop one more comment on dissection technique here. As you can see in this picture, this is what is referred to as the scissoring technique. You would insert the scissors closed in between, in this example, the artery and the nerve, and then you open them up. Okay, This is great because you destroy much less tissue as you would probably if you use a scalpel. I think in the majority of cases, when students think they can dissect with scalpels, eh, not really. You do break a lot of things. Um, even experienced dissectors will damage a lot of structures if they only use a scalpel. So try to avoid the scalpel as much as you can. Practice the scissoring technique, especially also in uh, connective tissue planes. I find the scissors very, very helpful. Let's have a brief look at what a typical spinal nerve would actually look like. Okay, So this is a transverse section through the body and what you can see here Here's your spinal cord and here is your standard typical mixed spinal nerve. You know, what goes anteriorly here, what lies on the left and right side of the bodies of the vertebrae will be your sympathetic chain and your sympathetic chain ganglia with their connecting rami, so rami communicantes. And then you can see that you actually have two main rami, which is your anterior ramus, usually bigger than the posterior rami here. You know, the posterior rami, as you can see, then will split up into a lateral and a medial branch, and these here will innervate not only the erector spinae muscles, but also contribute to the innervation of the skin via these cutaneous branches. The anterior rami, if we follow them along here, they will be traveling all the way at each spinal level, and you will very easily find them anteriorly if you look at the thorax and there we would just call them intercostal nerves. So now we can have a look at some of our superficial muscles of the back. This is a quite idealized picture from our dissector but it'll do for these purposes. The superficial muscles of the back are going to be the trapezius as you can see here. The dotted line is a line, actually are two lines that are going to be cut that will aid in the reflection of this muscle. Just refer to the dissector instructions for this and down here on your latissimus dorsi as well. So the superficial muscles are going to be your trapezius, the lat dorsi, and then the two rhomboids, the rhomboid major and the rhomboid minor, and a muscle that elevates the scapulae, which is called the levator scapulae. So as you can anticipate by looking at this picture, the order of dissection is going to be as follows. First, you're going to clean the surface of the trapezius and then reflect it. That's why these dashed lines are in here. You're going to do the same thing with the latissimus dorsi. And you're also going to study it and then reflect it. And the rhomboid major and minor muscles and the levator scapulae will also be identified. And then we will of course have to do this dissection bilaterally that we can then get to the deeper muscles of the back.
And if you pay close attention, you should see that the medial attachment of the trapezius is going to be along the external occipital protuberance. You can see right up here this little knobble that we have on the backs of our heads, uh, along the nuchal ligament, and then on the spinous processes of your vertebrae of C7 down to T12. On the lateral aspect, the trapezius will be attached to your clavicle and to your scapula. The trapezius is actually quite interesting because it has three different parts that have slightly different functions as well. If you look at the superior part here, it will attach to the lateral one-third of the clavicle and it will help elevate the scapula. The middle part will attach to the acromion and to the spine of the scapula. And so if these fibers contract, it will retract the scapula. The inferior part will attach pretty close near the medial end of the spine of the scapula and help in depressing it. To reflect it, you're going to have to take your fingers and push them underneath it from up here and from down here until your hands kind of meet underneath it. And then you should use scissors to detach it from the attachments as indicated in the dissector here. Once you've folded it back, you should be able to see some interesting things. For instance, the plexus of the cranial nerve number 11, so the spinal accessory nerve, and also branches of the anterior rami of some of the spinal nerves C3 and C4. But note that there's two muscles that are innervated via the spinal accessory nerve. One of them is the trapezius, and the other one is going to be the sternocleidomastoid, the SCM. Okay, let's have a look at the remaining muscles of the superficial layer of the back. Here's our latissimus dorsi muscle. It is the widest muscle here. Okay, the medial attachments are along here, basically from the spines of the vertebrae T7 down to T12. And this fascia, which is the thoracolumbar fascia, because it goes from the thorax down to the lumbar region. Okay, it also attaches medially to the ribs, you know, from ribs 9 through 12 lateral to where their angles are. This muscle will be innervated by no other but the thoracodorsal nerve, and it also gets its blood supply via the thoracodorsal artery. To reflect this muscle, you're going to have to stick your fingers in down, or you're going to have to stick your fingers underneath it, like we did with the trapezius, yeah, deep to the surface of the left dorsi, and transect it along this dashed line. Have a look at the dissector for how exactly to do this. Okay, then you're going to reflect it laterally, so you fold it away. Don't cut it off and also don't disturb where it's attached to the ribs. Yeah, there might also be an attachment to the inferior angle of the scapula. Well, if this is the case, don't disturb that attachment either. As you've reflected the trapezius already, you can also see these two rhomboids. Here is the rhomboid minor, which sits on top of the rhomboid major. These muscles have their name from the Greek word rhombos, which means shaped like a kite. The medial attachments of the rhomboid minor are going to be the nuchal ligament and the spinous processes of C7, which is also called vertebra prominence because it often has a very long spinous process, and T1, the first thoracic vertebrae. The lateral attachment of rhomboid minor, you can see it right here, is going to be the medial border of the scapula at the level of the spine of the scapula. And the medial attachments of rhomboid major are T2 to T5, the spinous processes here, and the lateral attachments are going to be the medial border of the scapula, inferior to where the spine of the scapula would be. Typically, you don't have a very clear separation of these two muscles, so you're just going to have to use their attachments as a guide to which one is actually which. Both of these muscles will help retract the scapula and also rotate it to depress the glenoid cavity of the shoulder joint. You're going to want to reflect these. To do this, you're going to have to insert your fingers deep to them and separate them from the deeper muscles. And then working from inferior to superior, you're going to use scissors to detach them from the medial attachment here along the spinous processes. And then you're going to fold them or reflect them laterally. You're going to open it like a little book. On the deep surface of these muscles, you should find a nerve and an artery, which is going to be the dorsal scapular nerve and the dorsal scapular artery and vein. This muscle up here is called the levator scapulae. Levare is Latin and it means to raise, so you can imagine what it's going to be doing. The superior attachments of the levator scapulae, we're not going to dissect them, don't worry, but the superior attachments are going to be the transverse processes of the upper four cervical vertebrae. These are not visible right now. The inferior attachments of the levator scapulae 
are going to be on the superior angle of the scapula here. And it is supplied by the dorsal scapular nerve and artery. When this muscle contracts, it'll elevate the scapula and also rotate it to help depress the glenoid cavity. So now let's have a very brief look at some cadaveric images. This large muscle here is the trapezius. Note the three parts. There's a superior part, the middle part, and the inferior part. Now they have slightly deviating names here because the fibers are actually descending from the top here. So these are called descending fibers, okay, or the upper fibers. And here are the transverse fibers from the middle part, and from the inferior part, the lower fibers, or called ascending fibers because they ascend up here in this direction. Deep to that, here is your rhomboid major. Rhomboid minor is still obscured. And here's the widest muscle, the latissimus dorsi. Let's go a little bit deeper on the next slide. Here we go. And now we have a view of the rhomboid major and the rhomboid minor. You can also see the levator scapulae attached right here. Next, we're going to have a look at the deep muscles of the back. The deep back muscles are muscles that act on and move the vertebral column. There are several of these. We're only going to dissect a few of them, though. Some of them you can already see in this picture here. The most important group of muscles are the erector spinae muscles. If you have a look at them from lateral to medial, that will be the iliocostalis, the longissimus, and the spinalis. Yeah? You can also call these the ILS muscles like I love spaghetti, iliocostalis, longissimus, and spinalis. Erector in Latin means the one who erects, as the name kind of implies, doesn't it? Um, these here will be lying deep to the intermediate layer of muscles. The spinalis muscle is the most medial column. The inferior attachment of this muscle is on the spinous processes, and the superior attachments of this muscle are also on the spinous processes. You can find this at both the lumbar, thoracic, and cervical vertebral levels. The longissimus muscle as the name implied, longissimus means the longest in Latin. This is the intermediate column of these three erectorospinae muscles, and it'll attach inferiorly on the sacrum and superiorly on the transverse processes of the thoracic and cervical vertebrae. The superior most part actually even attaches on the mastoid process. Then you have most laterally the iliocostalis muscle, which is going to attach inferiorly on the ilium or the iliac crest. And superiorly, it'll attach to the ribs, hence costa in its name, because costa means rib. This group of erector spinae muscles is all innervated via dorsal rami of spinal nerves. And now for something completely new, Blitz Anatomy, a review in a minute or less. Trapezius, remove trapezius. Deep to trapezius, rhomboid minor on top of rhomboid major. Above the rhomboid minor is the splenius capitis. Twist this to the side, have a look up here. Here's the sternocleidomastoid, hide. Here is the levator scapulae on the right side. Levator scapulae on the right side. Move down, click here. Latissimus dorsi, the widest. Look at this, hide. Even lower, serratus posterior inferior, hide. Higher up, hide rhomboids. Hide serratus posterior superior, hide splenius muscles. View erector spinae, from lateral to medial, Iliocostalis, longissimus, spinalis. Bilaterally, on their own, erector spinae. End of Blitz Review.